All right, now that we talked about the uh, network technology and the OSI model, and we talked about different modes of communications, let's talk about one of the important components of net the networking technology is called routing. Um, you can view the network as a graph of interconnected nodes, um, and each uh, edge between two nodes can be interpreted as a physical link. It could be a, a wired link or, or, or a wireless link. Um, the nodes on a LAN um, or, or uh, a wide area network uh, can be considered as being computers or routers um, or, or switches in that sense. If uh, one of the sen senders on this net network or one of the sender nodes on this network wants to send the data to a receiver node, the goal of, goal of routing then becomes to determine a path from the source node to the destination node through a minimal number of intermediary nodes that can be used to deliver a address information packet. An example of a route is basically, for example, in a um, circular network, um, a uh, a wire connection that connects um, each computer to the next computer on its uh, round robin clock that we saw the example earlier. So there are basically um, two uh, issues here at the heart of finding the route or, or the path. Um, finding an optimal or goal path in the routing graph is the first issue. This can be difficult um, with changing network loads or even changing network topologies. And once a route is established, getting all this information packets through the intermediary uh, routers to the receiver can become insufficient. So basically, we have two ideas, two problems. And what we need to address, finding the optimal or good path, or once finding this optimal or good path, to get the information go through. This is an example of a uh, network, and uh, the, the hard, solid, dark lines are the connections between the network nodes and the uh, arrow, gray arrows basically, are an example of a route that takes the information packets from the sender and routes them through the network, through the router, to the receiver node. Routing from a source to a destination can take place over two different kinds of uh, methods, connectionless mode or connection-oriented mode. In a connectionless mode, the pathfinding algorithm is executed every time a packet needs to be delivered, and um, consequently, the pathfinding algorithm needs to make sure that um, the current knowledge of network topology is used, and to find different hops to progress toward a destination. And each packet might find its way independent of other packets. For this process to work, every packet needs to carry the final destination IP address so that each intermediary node can evaluate where to send it next. Connectionless routers can become uh, essentially um, uh, an example of a connectionless uh, uh, routing uh, mode is the Internet protocol. In a connection-oriented modes, though, an explicit or implicit path um, from the source node to the destination has to be set before the transmission begins. And all the packets then flow the same path in the node graph from source to destination. So let's look at the, 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 the very important features of connectionless and connection-oriented routing. As I said, the path um, finding in connection less routing protocols need to be need to take place uh, need not to take place basically before any in, uh, connection has been established and so the packets um, need to use each of the packets need to use their own um, routing methodology or pathfinding algorithm and for that to happen we need to have the current network of the topology and each packet might also uh, go through different routers independently because each packet will have its own um, IP address for the destination and so regardless of the uh, traffic or the network topology routers may transfer 
uh, information packets differently, but all those information packets will be received by the destination uh, node because they carry the IP address of the destination node. Connectionless approaches or connection connection rest routing technologies basically are robust in the case of node failures and changing topology. If new nodes are added, routes can dynamically be computed, and then uh, if also the failure of the nodes uh, occur, they would not affect the overall routing. Connection rest protocols also tend to perform efficiently for short connections. In uh, larger networks, though, packets might not get to their destination as efficiently as possible because, again, traffic network topology changes will impede the efficiency of this routing technology. Although they guarantee that this, this routing protocols guarantee that the packets will arrive and they may not be efficient. And um, setting up the network becomes very easy using these connectionless protocols. In connection-oriented modes, as I said, an explicit or implicit path from the source node to the destination node has to be set up before the transmission begins. All um, the packets then flow the same path in a node graph from source to destination. Uh, ATM and X.25 are connection-oriented approaches in routing. <coughs> and also frame relays also an, an, another um, protocol. Um, there are certain features in connection-oriented protocols. For example, prior to transmission, an explicit or implicit path needs to be set up. This is done by the sender sending a connection setup packet to the destination. This special packet leaves a trace of routing information at each node on the path, which includes a connection identifier for that transmission session. Uh, and that identifier is also mapped to a corresponding output port. All the subsequent transmission packets flow, flow through the same path, which amounts to the, a port lookup in a math table at very at, at every intermediary node. So think about the connection packet going through one node to the next and setting up the information, and then each packet that needs to go, they go and they basically look look up in a lookup table to go where they have to go next to see where they have to go next. This way, routing can be done very efficiently at runtime. Uh, with a simple lookup table as opposed to executing a pathfinding algorithm um, while routing every single packet in the connection rest routing. Because there is a defined path in this connection oriented methods, a statistical mode of mo uh, network traffic can be essentially calculated uh, for any determined time. This information can be used to control access to the network and also avoid network congestion. For example, a new call to set up a route can be rejected if the network is heavily um, congested or if the traffic is high. Network layer basically takes care of the routing because routing is its main task. Together with the network layer, the transport layer protocols have also been defined to get data from a source node to a destination node in a reliable manner. So remember, routing is happening at the net network layer, and the transport layer takes care of the addressing of the packets and making sure that the, the packets have enough information to be used for the routing. So there are two main approaches in routing. There's a static route, actually three main approaches. We we talk about static routing and dynamic routing as the main categories, and then we talk about bro broadcast routing. The overall route, uh, overall route from a source to a destination in static routing is created using fixed paths. Routes for all source destination pairs are pre-computed either programmatically by a central network hub or they can be input by a network administrator. This source destination route information is then broadcast to every node in the network, establishing each node, to, um, basically enabling each node to create a um, table with entries that resolve an outgoing link given a sender and a destination. Any packet to be routed contains a destination address or a connection identifier in case of connection oriented network. A node can quickly look up and resolve the routing, the outgoing link for the routing and forward the packet to the next node. This kind of routing occurs efficiently uh, and systematically. However, static routing methods are, methods are not fault tolerant in case of node failure, packets will not be um, essentially rerouted 
and the sender nodes will have to wait until the entire um, affected pathway is repaired. Node failure is also um, it results in uh, request timeouts. Another big drawback for um, this kind of static routing uh, is uh, to com to optimally compute paths. Optimal routes can be computed and defined once, but when they need to be changed, uh, when the network topology changes. So if you even add a single computer to this net to this to this network, then um, the optimal paths may not stay optimal in this case, and you may need to recalculate re re the entire um, uh, routing table. Uh, static routing is is probably good for just small networks, but it's unattractive for large and dynamically changing networks. Um, and so for small subnetworks, though, um, you can essentially use this. And also in, in, in uh, larger networks, static routing techniques can basically suggest routes, uh, default routes, and then you can use other technologies and, and techniques such as adaptive routing to define uh, the routes. In adaptive routing, also referred to as dynamic routing, the path finding algorithm um, alters the path that a packet takes uh, through the network in response to changing network conditions that include um, node failure or congestion. The changing conditions also might dynamically occur basically when um, some nodes become obsolete or you add some additional nodes to your network. Um, and a very good example of a dynamic routing uh, uh, protocol is the Internet Protocol, or IP. Broadcast routing is um, uh, the different routing uh, methodology that we discussed here, uh, but it's essentially a special case of routing where a sender needs to broadcast a message to all of the nodes in the network. One straightforward method is to basically send the message packets to each destination node. But this requires that the source node have a complete list of all the destination nodes. So this is the first practical uh, issue that you have with this kind of broadcast um, or, or, or this straightforward method methodology. Uh, moreover, it turns out that the bandwidth um, using this technology will become totally wasted, and um, and so basically this straightforward technique is, is not the best way to perform broadcast routing. Another simple way to achieve the broadcast routing is basically to flood the network, uh, where at each node every incoming packet is sent to every outgoing um, uh, destination except on the one that it actually uh, was received on. And the packet duplication um, that can be happening here easily congests the network, therefore the terminology flooding. And uh, there has to be also a way to delete duplicate packets. For example, each router can keep track of sent packets in a subsequent in, in a sequence and delete packets if they arrive again. Uh, the most efficient way to broadcast messages is by using the spanning tree broadcasting protocol. A spanning tree basically consists of links in a network that includes all of the nodes but has no loop. If each node in the network knows the incoming outgoing ports that belong to the spanning tree, broadcast can be uh, achieved very efficiently by each uh, router only forwarding packets on the outgoing spanning tree lines. Uh, using a spanning tree is the most efficient way but requires that the spanning tree be computed and communicated to all nodes in the network which is non-trivial if the network conditions change. So let's take a look at how a spanning tree works. So, what is a spanning tree? A spanning tree is all of the links on the network that contains all the nodes without producing any loops. So, if you think about that, each node knows where it is on the spanning tree. To broadcast packets, send the, the, the nodes will basically, or the routers will send the nodes, the, the packets only to the nodes on the spanning tree. There are two big disadvantages, as I just about, talked about in the, slide, in the previous slide. You need to compute and communicate the spanning tree to all of the nodes, and also it becomes non-trivial uh, and subject to change. So let's look at this network here, an example. If you look at all these black lines that connect the nodes in the network, 
through the routers. That is essentially the, your network topology. And uh, out of the um, gray arrows, directional arrows, essentially um, represent your spanning tree. If you look at these directional arrows, the gray directional arrows, uh, they do not contain a loop, but they contain all the nodes, or all the nodes, routers, and computers on this network belong to the spanning tree. Now, when a, the network, uh, when the node A on top here wants to send the information to all the spanning, uh, to all the um, computers or nodes in, in this graph, it basically sends the information out through the, the spanning tree. So, packets come out of this uh, gray arrow here, and then the router would send it, send it instead of on the three outgoing links, actually four links, it will only send them to the outgoing spanning three gray arrow links. So it goes to the router on top here and goes to the node at the bottom here. Then this router also sends out the packet to the outgoing, to, to, to the outgoing spanning tray links. So basically, uh, to these two computers up there and the router at the bottom. This router at the bottom also sends them out, sends the packet out on the outgoing spanning tree links, and therefore you see that um, the computer to the left gets the packet, router at the bottom here, and router in the middle. And then your um, router at the bottom here sends the messages out on the spanning tree, so the three computers down here will get it. Routers in the middle here, the router in the middle sends out on the spanning tree, so the, net, the computer up here gets the packet, and the router down here gets the packet. The router again sends it out to the spanning tree. Actually, there has to be a, a link at the bottom here. This network also, uh, this computer also has, is on the spanning tree. So this computer at the bottom gets it. The router on top gets it. The computer in the middle gets it. The router at the bottom gets it. The router sends the packet out on the spanning tree. These three computers would get it. The router at the top sends the packet on the spanning tree out on the spanning tree and the three computers at the, at the top here get the packet. So this is essentially an example of broadcast routing using the spanning tree. So let's suppose that this network, this router becomes unstable and, and uh, leaves the network. Essentially your spanning tree has to be recalculated. All right. If you look at uh, the applications that require streaming and real-time distribution of media or media content, these application typically, uh, applications typically require large network bandwidths as well as um, timely delivery, decoding, and rendering of the media data on the client side. So uh, by nature, we know that multimedia data is... Uh, are huge is voluminous and also uh, it, it, it needs c compression techniques to reduce the amount of data that you need to distribute. The compression mechanisms uh, usually produce varying bit rates that result in traffic bursts during distribution. For multimedia traffic the following bit rate categories are basically um, generally uh, considered. CBR or constant bit rate uh, it is basically intended for real-time applications that require tightly constrained delay and jitter. For example, in voice communications um, or uh, transmitting live sports events over the internet. These are basically usually use uh, constant bitrate. Real-time variable bitrate or real-time VBR is defined to also categorize real-time applications that need constrained delay and jitter but in this case, the source can produce short data bursts. We also can define non-real-time variable bitrate or non-real-time VBR um, that uses basically is used basically to classify multimedia traffic for non-real-time applications. And this kinds of bitrate usually have bursty traffic characteristics. Unspecified bitrate is intended for non-real-time applications, and it's tolerant to delay and jitter. Normally, uh, unspecified bitrate service does not guarantee on-time delivery and produces no synchronization to play in real time. Available bitrate is the term that is used for multimedia traffic where a sender can adjust or remain adjustable to the bitrate needs um, and also the, the bitrates that also are provided by the network. 
For example, applications might have the ability to reduce the, their bit rate if there is uh, congestion on the network or increase it if the net congestion is not uh, occurring on the network. Uh, it's easier to com come up with a plan for data delivery strategies that need synchronization for constant or unchanging truthfuls uh, compared to the ones that require vari bit variable bit rate delivery. For example, you could compute a statistical measure of the latency between the sender and the receiver uh, on the network and by doing that maintain a small but fixed playout buffer that allows multimedia to deliver uh, to the client node um, and also be rendered in uninterruptedly uh, on the client side. Sometimes though, even with constant bitrate networks, the truth put might vary with time and there are several uh, reasons that this might occur. There may be a node or link failure. When a node fails, data needs to be routed, rerouted along nodes and other links, and this causes traffic to increase on other do, uh, uh, routes. There may be network congestion, and congestion essentially describes the state which the demand of the network's bandwidth capacity exceeds the physical availability of the bandwidth. Congestion happens when too many packets are present in the subnet, or part of a subnet when the truth would decreases with increasing load. For example, on 10 megabits per second network with 100 computers, if 50 computers are simultaneously transmitting data to other sides at 1 megabits per second, then the no network demand um, will basically exceed by 10 megabits per second. And this essentially um, uh, results in congestion and results in lost or dropped packets. There may have been a couple, there may be a couple of traffic policy mechanisms that we need to put in place for controlling this kind of congestion. Flow control is um, another um, issue that can impose during the end to end delivery to prevent loss of data at the receiving end due to slow receiving nodes. If the sender node transmits data too quickly, much quicker than the prop than, than the receiver can buffer and consume them, it will result in buffer overflows and ultimately it causes the data loss. For example, on a network with a large one gigabit per second capacity, if a fast fast computer is sending at two hundred megabits per second capacity and a computer slower computer is only capable of receiving at ten megabits per second, packets would be not picked up in time for delivery and this results in data data being lost. Flow control protocols need to be established here to control effective flow of data. So now that we talked about multimedia traffic control, one of the probably most important topics here is congestion control. Congestion control aims to provide a mechanism to control the volume of data packets flowing in the network. These met methods basically are created to automate and shape the network traffic um, and the ideas they actually have are basically bor borrowed concepts from bandwidth classifications, queuing theory, monitoring and policing flow of packets, congestion management, and fairness to network access. One uh, standard way to manage traffic is by regulating the data burst and restricting them uniformly over time. For example, you have a video stream that, is pro that basically produces variable data rates resulting in 140 packets the first, second, 10 packets in the next, 30 packets in the next, and 130 40 packets in its last second, instead of doing this bursty packet rates, we can manage them to essentially ensure that one packet is inserted into the network every two and a half milliseconds or, or every 12 and a half milliseconds. There are two predominant ways of performing this congestion control, leaky bucket and token bucket. The leaky bucket algorithm is used to control the rate at which the sender node injects packets into the network. It manages the bursty net gen generated by the multimedia data packets and injects them into the network at a very steady rate, as opposed to erratic rate of high and low volumes. A good working analogy to this is essentially uh, looking at uh, automobile traffic controls that are trying to enter the freeway. Although cars may come at any rate and want to enter the freeway, and in this case cars can be related to packets and the freeway is your network. A signal monitors and allows one car every few 
seconds to enter the network, the, 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 the freeway. And in this case, we can have a mechanism that only allows one packet every few seconds into the network. This allows a steady flow of the packets or, or traffic or, or, or cars in, into the freeway, therefore creating an, a or avoiding traffic jams. In this method, a policing mechanism is put in place between the node and the network. The packets are basically coming into this bucket that has a um, hole at the bottom at any rate. But since there's one hole at the bottom, packets will be released to the network at a very steady rate. If more packets are coming in, the bucket becomes fuller and fuller and fuller. But the same stream of uh, packets will be sent out to the network. If fewer and fewer packets tend to come in, then the bucket becomes uh, less full and less full and less full. So the, to the left here, you can see an example of the leaky, leaky packet. Packets essentially are entered in a uh, leaky bucket. Packets are essentially entered or sent by the sending um, nodes into the bucket, and the bucket releases them at a very steady rate into the network. And so, although the incoming traffic from the sender node may be bursty, um, the outgoing traffic into the network will become um, very uniform. The second approach uh, in controlling the congestion on the network is called token bucket. The token bucket method differs from the leaky, leaky bucket in that the leaky bucket imposes a hard limit on the data or packet rates being transmitted. But the token bucket allows a certain amount of burstiness while also still maintaining an upper limit on the average packet rates being transmitted. The algorithm is described in this picture and let me just go over it and then we'll talk about it. So uh, in the token bucket, it works by adding a token into the bucket every t seconds. The bucket has capacity of holding n tokens. After it reaches its capacity, no additional tokens are generated. When a bucket, when a packet of n bytes arrives, or, or small n, small n tokens will be removed from the bucket and the packet is released to the network. If n tokens are not available, the packet is buffered until additional tokens come in at a steady rate, until you have the number of tokens needed to release the packet. This method allows bursts of up to large n bytes, which is the size of your um, bucket token, and over a large period of time. The output rate is limited to 1 over t uh, bytes per second, which is the amount of time that it takes for a, a token to be added to, to, the, to, the, to the bucket. Initially, when the computer is ready to transmit and tokens are available in the bucket, the transmission begins with a burst of packets or bytes because tokens are available. After the tokens are consumed, the traffic gets regulated and therefore less and less packets will be sent to the network. If large C is the um, capacity of token uh, bucket or the number of tokens that you have, if large M is the network throughput and large R is the steady state rate, then the maximum time for which a burst lasts T subburst can be calculated by this uh, formula. M, which is the network throughput, minus R, which is the steady rate, divided by C, the number of tokens. And um, so this basically takes care of the process. Now let's see how it looks like. In the right-hand side here, you see the token bucket. So um, the bucket does not send any, any packets out until it has enough tokens. So the tokens keep being added. And once the tokens are added, in this case, you see the four tokens are added. When these four data packets come in, they will be sent all together. So basically, you can think of it as a bucket with having larger holes, but the larger holes that can be closed up or open, depending on how many tokens are in the bucket. The final topic to talk about in this um, part of controlling uh, network, multimedia networks, is flow control. Flow control is the process of overseeing the data transmission rates between a sender and a receiver in the network. 
This is different from congestion control, which is used for controlling the flow of the data packets over a network <coughs> when congestion occurs. Flow control is, con uh, is basically a contract between a sender and a receiver node on the network. Flow control is necessary to control cases when a, first, a fast sender sends data to a slow receiver, which can happen when the receiving node has a heavy traffic load or less processing power compared to the sending node. There are two different kinds of controlling the flow. <coughs> Closed loop flow control and open loop flow control. And finally, we talk about transmit flow control as a mechanism that tries to address the issues. <coughs> In closed loop flow control, um, the sender is able to get information about the network congestion status and whether the packet being sent by the sender reaches the intended receiver. This information can then be used by the sender node in a variety of ways. For example, the sender might adapt its transmission activity by either increasing or decreasing it depending on network conditions. Available bitrate is one place where closed loop flow control is efficiently used. Open loop flow control, however, um, does not have this way of having getting the feedback from the receiver. So in the open loop flow control, the sender cannot get or does not have a feedback from the receiver. Flow control in this case is, is achieved by allowing resources by reservation. For example, in an ATM network, which is an asynchronous transfer mode network, resource allocation is made at connection setup, and the resource activity help control the flow of traffic. This simple means of flow control is the preferred flow control mechanism that is used by constant bitrate, variable bitrate, and unspecified bitrate multimedia. The third flow control mechanism we talk about here is called a transmit flow control. In transmit flow control, um, a process is basically refers to the process that is used to control the rate of data transmission from a sender so that the data can be received successfully by another terminal. One standard way to achieve this transmission or, or this transmit flow control is by using a sliding window mechanism. The sliding window algorithm allows the sender node to transmit data packets um, at its own speed until a window size of W is used up. And once the window basically is completely full, the sender will not send any more packets. But the sender starts receiving acknowledgments from the receiver uh, of those sent packets once the packets are delivered. These acknowledgments empty up that window and the sender will be allowed to send more, more packets. This mechanism is basically, or the sliding window, is basically used in the tra uh, TCP or transmit control protocol um, to ensure the flow control. Let's look at this picture and see how it works. Let's say that the sender is capable of sending a lot of packets um, um, over time. A window of size 4 is set up for this uh, sender. The dark gray uh, blocks in the window mean that a packet has been sent with no acknowledgement received, and the white blocks in the window uh, mean that um, yeah, that uh, uh, slot in the window is open for transmission. So the sender sends packet 1, blocks the first, packet 2, blocks the second, sends packet 3, blocks the third, and sends packet 4, blocks the fourth block of the window. And at this point, after sending the four packets, the four windows um, and the four window locations are essentially blocked out, so the sender is not allowed to send any more packets. And it, at this time, the sender starts waiting for the acknowledgments of receipt of those packets that it already sent. So let's say that packet um, 3 is received at this point here by the receiver, and the acknowledgment is sent. So once the acknowledgment is received by the sender, uh, the block is opened for the sender to send packets. And so um, right after that, acknowledgement of another receipt of the packet has been received, and so two uh, empty slots in the window is open now. And then the, pa the transmitter or the sender is ready to send packets 5 and packets 6, and the window is now full, so the transmitter waits for the um, emptying of the window to be able to send more of the packets. 
So this, as I said, is one of the techniques that is used in the TCP protocol to ensure uh, the good rate of um, packet transmission, basically to ensure the flow control.